Today, today is a very special day for today we have a brown box on Short Circuit. You know what that means? That means networking. And this is a fun one. This is the, oh God, I don't know how to say it. Decisio, Deciso. I'm gonna go with Des Deciso for the rest of this video. But this is a router and a pretty cool one because it's designed to run open source firmware. In particular, you can see it right there. OpenSense or OPN Sense, however you want to say it, which is a fork of PFSense and I much prefer it over PFSense for a number of reasons. But the main thing is that this device is made by the company that manages the OpenSense open source router project. It's pretty big. I mean, right off the bat, we've got a getting started sheet of paper. What does it tell you to do? Pre-install the OpenSense Business Edition. That is the commercial paid version that gives you a few extra things. We'll talk about that a bit later. And then we've got the power cables, standard C13 to C14, because this is meant to go in a rack, I guess, and PDUs usually don't have normal plugs. Oh, they do give you the normal power cables. And then just a USB. Mini. Very simple packaging. There's not a whole lot in here. This is the DEC 4280 from Decisio. What did I say I was gonna call it? Deck, deck IO? I don't know. In terms of ports, we've got four SFP 28 25 gig ports, four SFP plus 10 gigabit ports, and four RJ45 base 2.5 gig ports. There's a USB over here. We've got a console port for a serial connection, two power indicators for the power supplies, and I think that this is a reset button, probably. And then all that's left, I guess, is this grill. Airflow. It's 3D printed though, that's super cool. What's around back? Dual redundant power supplies. I mean, I guess they probably are serviceable from inside, but they're not hot swap. They do have individual power buttons and there are two of them, which is nice. We've got a grounding screw and then fans. A big part of the design of this thing, according to their website, is that they spent a bunch of time modeling the airflow and cooling so that this could use the least amount of energy possible on cooling, not being wasteful, and also cooling it well, because there's a fair bit of hardware in here. I guess we should just open it up, right? Hopefully I don't break it, because I would like to try it later. I was like, I'm gonna be smart and bring the knock to a screwdriver, lttstore.com that has torque spits. I didn't check if they were the right Torx bits. <laughs> the only CPU information they list is Epic 3000 CPU, the fastest Epic 3000 CPU available for the most demanding network loads on this specific one. So it's a 16 core dual die chip. Also inside is 64 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, which we are going to see in like actually seconds. And a one terabyte NVMe SSD, which is a fair bit of storage um, for a router. Warranty void if seal broken. Come on guys, what is this? That's a load of uh, These are apparently development units, so um, it could be ever so slightly different from the production hardware. But from my understanding, I believe they did do some 3D printed stuff for this, which I think is what these are. That's cool. Wow, this is very like clean. I wanna take the front off too, cause I can't really see everything. Oh God. Oh God, there's different sizes of screws now. Two different types of screws, it's not that bad. I mean, they're the same threading, these are just shorties. Beautiful. Hey, there we go, damn, that's pretty. We got the power supplies over here, as I suspected. They are internal, they are not hot swap per se, but they do appear to be easily swap. There's these big chonky connectors that run from each power supply to the board. They do have little screws connecting them, but you just disconnect those screws, I imagine, and it will just come out. Let's find out. Hey, there we go. Yeah, okay, so those are pretty easy to swap. 12 volts, 16.7 amps. So that works out to like, what, 180 watts or something like that? 200 watts each. Okay, cool. I see what they mean about like optimized cooling, hey? They made their own 3D print things. Why, what is this? Do you see this? This is so strange. Why does it have that shape? Does this like reduce turbulence or something? I know like on their product page, they have a photo of the airflow simulation, like the fluid dynamics, and it looks very, Smooth. <laughs> cool, I guess. They're 93% efficient power supplies. What else we got? Is there anything about the cooling in here aside from just this, this sick photo? It's a 42 dBA. It's pretty quiet. It's not like dead silent, but if you were in an office space with some people talking, you, you definitely wouldn't be able to hear it. Or if it's in a closet, you're not gonna have any issues there. How do these come in? What the heck? Oh, ouchie, that didn't feel very nice. These bits just butt up against the motherboard and then there's nubbins that stick into the fan holes. So this is just like friction vibing here. Cool, simple. I like that you don't need screwdriver to take that apart, but also it was a little finicky to get in and out. We got RAM here, what's the RAM? 
Transcend, 16 gigabyte, unbuffered, 3200 megatransfers per second. Put that back in. And then what's the SSD? Also Transcend. It's a one terabyte, is it like decent? I don't know, I'm sure it's fine. There is two slots though. You could put a second one in there and then like raid them, that's cool. I think when you install OpenSense, there is an option to boot it from ZFS. Cool, yeah, I would slap another SSD in here. Although, now that I'm thinking about it, this is a very expensive device. There probably should just be two SSDs in here. Or at least give you the option to order it with two. There's a slot there. Seems like an opportunity to make some money. I don't know. We've got absolute chungus heat sinks over here. Oh, hey, look, we can see the inside of the, the duct. It's a less advanced shape than I was thinking. Oh, look, and then the fans. You wanna swap the fan? Oh, just slides out of there. I would like to see the CPU. Let's see the CPU. These screws on this heatsink don't have springs. It's just hard mounted. Those are non-ferrous screws. Okay, great. Use ferrous screws. They have magnetic capabilities, meaning you can pick them up when you drop them. Phew. Hey, look at that. That's a CPU. It's definitely like a, an embedded one. It's not socketed. I don't think we're gonna get any information by scraping off the goop, but that's what it looks like. Do I scrape off the goop? I might scrape off the goop. So look at that, it just says AMD Epic, you bastards. It's an Epic embedded 3451, max turbo frequency of three gigahertz, wonderful. Now I need to make it have goop again. Yeah, there's lots of goop on here. I'd rather just like reuse their existing goop. I wouldn't recommend this usually, but this is like a brand new device, so it's probably fine. But also, don't do this. Let's put this back on. There we go, okay. That's how you do that, in case you were wondering. Okay, how do I get this one out? Probably have to take the motherboard out for that. Yeah, there we go, okay, cool. What is this? This is an EZE810 CAM1. That makes sense, the A10. This is an Intel uh, NIC, it's a network card. For what, though? Oh, right, right! This is the 100 gig network card, just in chip form. This powers the four 25 gig ports. The 10 gig ports run off of the SOC, to my understanding, along with these RJ45 ports, but they needed a little more horsepower to run this 100 gig, and they're using an Intel 810. I found something that'll be perfect for this. Um, obviously our thermals, just in general now, are completely invalid. <laughs> but I've got some of the Honeywell PTM7950 phase change thermal pads that we actually sell in LTT store now. Uh, this stuff is super cool. You put it on and it's like a solid, and then once it heats up, it turns into a goo and kind of fills all the crevices. But this stuff is like damn near indestructible. I think it can handle like 150 degrees Celsius for a thousand hours or something crazy like that, which is perfect for this application because I know that this thermal paste pad goop stuff is not gonna have any problems down the road. Okay, it's on there. Honeywell on there. There we go, okay. Pro tip, don't take that off. Other than that, we got power distribution on the back. That's a NIC, SOC, RAM, storage, power supply hookups, lots of ports. Let's put this thing back together, turn it on, and uh, route some packets. Very quickly, hopefully. But not before this message from our sponsor, Pulseway. Managing your IT systems shouldn't be difficult, and our sponsor Pulseway makes performing important actions on your systems simpler, while having complete visibility into your network from anywhere. All you need is Pulseway on your phone, and you can monitor, manage, and troubleshoot your workstations. It works on any operating system, so take control of your servers and IT systems with Pulseway today by trying out a commitment-free trial at the link down below. Okay, I think it's back together. I hope, seemingly. I don't have any more par oh, damn it. I know how it gets airflow now. I wasn't really looking, but these are exhaust fans, which means it's gonna pull in air all along the front here, all around all those ports, and then it just happens to get sucked through in a few particular places. Now, if you're wondering why I have this thing, I'm not just doing a short circuit on this because it's cool. I'm, I'm also doing it because of that. Um, it's because we're gonna be using these as our routers for the office. And I say routers because we have two of them. <laughs> Let's turn it on. Very curious to see how loud this thing is. Hopefully we didn't modify that in any way. That's super not that loud. And there's actually quite a bit of airflow coming through this, considering the noise level. Let's hook it up. Okay, so ports zero is assigned to LAN address. Oh good, there is actually a port labeled zero. Okay, and port one is assigned to WAN and uses DHCP to obtain an IP address. 
So we will plug in that. This is our incoming internet connection into WAN, which means this box should now have internet. And then we need something to plug into zero. We made some changes. We now have two computers on the table. This is my test bench. It's an Epic 7402P with a ConnectX 6 card, dual 25 gig. And then we have a Minisform MSO1, which is a 13900H kind of laptop based little mini computer, which has the same network card in it as well. We're gonna be using this one as like a server and this one as like a client so we can run just a basic speed test through this box just to see what it can do. Because supposedly this thing can firewall at 60 gigabit, which is quite a bit. It can also do threat protection at 7.5 gigabit, which is pretty cool, like IPS, IDS with presumably Suricata. I just wanna be able to test if we can do like 50 gig between the two. I don't have a way to really like easily plug in 60 gig per client into each of these and like combine those, at least in a, a way that will be quick for me to do on set. So it's just gonna be 50 gig, but realistically that's still a lot to be frank. <laughs> so let's try it. Now that I'm thinking about it, this mini's form right here, I think is 600 bucks US maybe. And this network card you can get used for like a hundred bucks. It has half as many ports. You only have two 25 gigs and two 10 gigs, but pretty cost effective option considering the cost of this. Obviously few downsides there, but Eh? Okay, so this should have a DHCP server on it by default. Hey, there we go. Let's go through the wizard. Host name, Thicky. Domain name, damn. We'll use Google DNS. It's a pretty basic setup wizard. It's enough to get you with a DHCP range and your WAN connected, but it's not really gonna go beyond that. Uh, especially for what we're gonna try to do with bonding a bunch of connections. This is a, uh, it's pretty basic. <laughs> This is what OpenSense looks like. If you're familiar with PFSense, it's basically the same interface. A lot of the menus are the same, but you just take the menus from the top bar and bloop onto the side. I personally think it's a little easier to get around and I just like the fact that it's more up to date, but I could spend literally like three hours going through every single menu. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do that. I'll show you a, a couple quick ones. We've got the dashboard here. Uh, in firewall, we can see our firewall rules. I've created a couple networks already for the test we're gonna do in a little bit, so ignore that. We've got interfaces, you can list them all and set assignments, you can create VLANs and aggregates and connect to VPN, like OpenVPN or IPsec. You can control your DHCP server. Here, this is what the settings for DHCP server look like. If you've used OpenSense or PFSense before, these will look very familiar to you. We're currently using Unbound DNS, and that's what this looks like. So if you're more interested in the ins and outs of OpenSense as a firewall and routing software, there's lots of other videos. We'll link to some down below that are cool that give you a good overview of it. But broadly, it's a fast, secure, open source, self-hostable routing firewall software. It should be running OpenSense Business Edition by default. Uh, you can just switch it over to the non-business edition if you want, but it does come with a one-year license for free with it. And then after that, it's 149 euros. You get access to a integrated GeoIP database, which you can already kind of get for free, but it's just easier. You get a virtualization image of it, which is again, just kind of easier. Uh, Open Central, that could be useful for you. If you have a bunch of these or even just two, it's like a centralized monitoring setup. So you can have multiple of them exposed in kind of one, one dashboard. And other than that, it's basically uh, a, an ebook that tells you how to use it better and a 20% discount if you want support. But the other thing is you're just kind of supporting an open source project, which is cool on its own. We've been running the business edition for like over a year now, and not to say that we had any issues with the normal version, the community edition. Um, but it is nice to just kind of have a little bit more peace of mind when you're updating it, knowing that it should just be fine. <laughs> we have everybody's favorite Flex Optics Universal Direct Attach Cables. These things are awesome. They come unprogrammed or you can order them programmed if you want, you have to pay a little bit of a fee. But the basic thing is you can program this cable to be recognized as any number of other vendors' cables. I could program this side to be Cisco, and this side to be Dell, and this side to be Mellanox, like whatever you wanna do, so that when I plug this cable in, it thinks it's a Mellanox cable. And this side, well, we're plugging into an Intel mix, so I'll tell it that it's an Intel cable. And both devices think that they're using supported cables. They should just work. 
It's very nice. You can run into situations where if you have like, let's say a Dell switch and you're having problems and you contact support, they're gonna see, oh, that's not a Dell cable. Sorry, we're not gonna support that. This way they don't know. Not that I'm endorsing lying to your support reps, but it's a, it's a consideration. <laughs> so let's program some. Uh, they put little stickers on here so you can tell which side is which if you program them differently. If you plug a fiber transceiver into the flex box, it'll actually tell you the light levels. You can also use it as like a, uh, a, a light meter. If you're having problems with your fiber, you think you're not getting enough gain, just plug it in to whatever transceiver you're using and it'll tell you exactly. We've got everything cabled up with two of our 25 gig flex optics cables to each computer, our minis forum, and my test bench. I've installed Proxmox 8.1 on both of them and set up a container each with its own network. So we've got really four networks, one per cable here. Then I installed iPerf and started running it. So now in theory, I see blinking lights. There is traffic on all four NICs. So if we go to our dashboard here, there you go. 25 gig in on each interface, 25 gig out. That's total 50 gigabit. That's a, that's a fair bit of traffic. I mean, considering we're at 29% CPU usage. Mind you, this is with an MTU of 9,000. I suspect if we went to a normal MTU, uh, which is like the max packet size, you would probably have quite a bit more CPU usage. Uh, it is going through the firewall. It is passing rules. We're technically passing traffic, kind of like inter-VLAN routing, but really it's inter-network routing, inter-subnet routing, because each of these is its own subnet slash network. Um, the traffic has to get past. Look at all those packets. They're routing to places. I mean, in terms of the rest of it, clearly it's it's quite fast. Um, it's not getting any louder. I think my test bench is louder. The Noctua fans on there. I, I don't I don't notice any sort of ramp up. If we go to temperatures, it says it's vibing at like 50 degrees Celsius. That's not bad. Remember, we did take the heat sink off, so those numbers mean pretty much nothing. Yeah, it's a router. It rips. The hardware is pretty cool. I like that it's built by a company that makes cool software. I do wish it had two SSDs though. I guess I haven't said the price yet. Uh, it's 6,000 euros, which is, whew, that's a lot of money. <laughs> when you compare to other offerings, like if you were to buy a FortiGate, for instance, that can do similar throughput, you know, it, it's not out to lunch, but it is, it's a fair bit of money, especially considering this minis forum right here. If you're to buy that with 32 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte SSD, it's 830 US dollars. Plus you buy like a dual port 25 gig NIC or you could do a hundred gig NIC and split that into four 25 gigs like this box has. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at a thousand, maybe 1200 US dollars. It's a hefty premium to pay. I don't know that I would buy a product like this. For me, it's always been very much a DIY approach, but it's still very cool and it's awesome to see a company that we like that makes good software make some cool hardware.